Hello there and welcome to this lonely, desolate stretch of Highway 30 on a windy day here in South Central Idaho. Uh, my name is Sean Wilsey. I'm a geology professor at the College of Southern Idaho. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit of this area's geology, looking at some really unique features um, that I hope impress you and also educate you. Um, so let's go ahead and head across the road here. Um, maybe one of the more I guess historic and interesting road signs in South Central Idaho lies just ahead here. So if we take a look at this sign here, you might have seen this before. This has been in uh, some historical books and other publications. Petrified watermelons, take one home to your mother-in-law. So if we look behind the sign here, we can see there's a whole field of these rounded boulders ranging in size from, you know, maybe softball size all the way up to beach ball size and even a little bit bigger. And of course, if you're a farmer or rancher here in southern Idaho, the last thing you want in your fields is a bunch of rocks. And so maybe that's part of the reason why they're looking to get people to grab these rocks and take them home to their mother-in-law. These are the petrified watermelons uh, that are talked about on the sign there. But that sign actually inspired the name of these deposits. These rounded boulders that litter the path of the Snake River in different parts of southern Idaho um, were the name for these, the formal stratigraphic name is melon gravels. And so that name was actually somewhat inspired by this sign about the petrified uh, watermelons. So we're gonna take a look at these in a little bit more detail. It's actually a pile of them here across the road. Uh, they've been kind of scooped up and moved about. You, you can see some of the sizes here and how large these get. I'll put myself in here for a little bit of scale. So some of these are approaching about a meter, three feet or so in diameter, maybe a little bit bigger than that. But we're gonna head down uh, just to the south a little bit and look at these in place and see if we can deduce the, the story here. So what are these melon gravels and just how did they get here? Okay, I've come about a mile south or upstream from where we saw the petrified watermelon sign. We're looking here at the Snake River, looking to the south. Uh, if we swing around this way to the west, and then to the north, we can see the bridge here, Interstate 84, running east to west through the Snake River Plain. Um, and I originally didn't have this stop planned. I actually was heading for a different location. But when I looked up on this hill, I thought I should come up here and investigate and then share with you what I found. And so we're standing on basalts here, lava flows from McKinney Butte, a uh, shield volcano in this area that erupted about 52,000 years ago. So the cliffs lining the east side of the Snake River here are these basaltic lava flows. But what's really of interest and what we're really focusing on here is what's sitting on top of it. So if you look at the top of this cliff band, several hundred feet above the Snake River, we have this field of boulders. Again, much like we saw at the petrified watermelon sign, but now look at the size of some of these boulders. These boulders are big. These boulders are anywhere up to maybe 10 feet, maybe more in diameter, three or four meters. Um, absolutely mammoth boulders. And then let's also look at the shape of these boulders. If these boulders had fallen off a cliff somewhere, we'd expect to have pretty angular shapes. But as we look at the surfaces of these rocks here, we see that they're somewhat rounded and smooth. Not perfectly, and not perfectly spherical, but overall the shape of many of these boulders is somewhat rounded, or in sort of a sediment classification system, we might say they're at least sub-rounded. Nice one right here below me. Um, we're gonna walk a little bit to the, the north here, um, and what really drew me up here was this exceptionally big boulder at the top, just in the distance over here. Uh, one last thing we can look at in looking back down at the Snake River is notice that the canyon here to our 
south looking upstream is much more narrow up here so the canyon is more narrow then when I swing around 180 degrees towards the freeway we see a much broader valley that's an important part of the story we're gonna look at here so let's head over to this big boulder and see what other evidence we can find and then I'll take you to my original destination which is down in this big field of boulders or melon gravels here closer to the freeway so let's head down this thing here and what we're trying to do is deduce the story here now if you're familiar with southern Idaho and its landscapes and geologic history you probably already have the answer these rocks that have been rounded rocks only become rounded when they collide with other rocks so when rocks are in collision that chips off the sharp corners <clears throat> eventually shapes them into more rounded forms such as we see here and in order to do that you need to have a mechanism some sort of energy source that can move not just rocks of this size um, but also be able to transport them in such a way that they collide and bang together and so what we're looking at here you probably figured it out is we're looking at evidence for a very high energy event that involved water these this is the stark evidence of the Bonneville flood that's deposited all these rounded boulders here on top of these basalt cliffs so the Bonneville flood was a big event I've talked about in other videos that happened a little over 17,000 years ago tore through the Snake River Plain and along this path of the Snake River on its way out to uh, the Columbia and then the Pacific one boulder in particular I wanted to spend a few minutes looking at is this gargantuan boulder here that's see if I can back up and give you a little more scale but I saw this thing from a distance I could see that it was somewhat rounded overall in shape and this boulders maybe 20 feet in diameter again I'll try to put myself in there to give it a little bit of scale this thing's huge it's probably eight to nine feet tall three meters or so this way and dimensionally it might be yeah 15 or so feet five or so meters in diameter uh, this thing's massive and so again just kind of thinking about the amount of energy it takes to transport something of this size the other thing we can see here as we look at some of the surfaces of these is we can see that the surfaces of some of these boulders is striated or has lines running through it and it's somewhat polished to the touch uh, kind of has a, a varnish on it here but it's also quite smooth we're going to go down and look at that more at the lower boulder field but let's uh let's just take this into consideration here way up on this terrace above this 52,000 year lava flow are an immense deposit of large boulders more or less rounded in shape so we'll head down to the lower boulder bar and we'll try to put the whole story together there so we'll see you down there okay so we just came from these cliffs here you can still see that big rounded boulder there at the top of the cliff band that i was just at so i moved down off that cliff band down the slope heading to the north or northwest and now we're looking at this big expansive boulder bar that extends actually well beyond what you can see here and i thought we'd stop here and get kind of a big picture view and then get up close and personal with these boulders to see what they have to tell us but remember you might ask well why are the boulders in this section remember i told you that just to the south the snake river canyon has a, a much tighter constriction the canyon walls are much closer together it's much more narrow and so when the Bonneville flood came through these narrow areas um, it accelerated the speed and the energy of the water think about when you uh, hold your thumb over the garden hose by constricting and reducing the size of the opening of the garden hose you allow the water to come out with a lot more force and velocity <clears throat> so as the water from the flood was coming down through these narrow canyon corridors 
it accelerated the velocity of the water it had a lot more energy so it was able to do a lot more plucking and eroding and transporting of these big boulders through these narrow sections it was a lot more energy coming through these narrow sections to move these massive boulders as the flood water entered these larger wider expansive canyon sections the velocity slowed down the energy decreased and therefore these big boulders that it had been transporting were dropped to the bottom of the riverbed and that's what forms these big boulder bars these wide sections of canyon where the water slows down considerably now as you look at this boulder bar let's see what you can observe with respect to the shapes of the boulders now it's a little bit subtle but take a good look at this and see what see what you can see here and to my eye and hopefully you'll agree it looks like a lot of the boulders kind of are on a slant if you will they kind of look like shingles or dominoes kind of in this fashion here I'm showing with my hand this big one right here hopefully I can point to it correctly you can see kind of has a, a sloping edge on the left side and then an abrupt drop off on the right side let's go look at these in a little bit more detail here and see what we can see uh, with these boulders these melon gravels that have been transported by the Snake River and see if we can make uh, some conclusions or some interpretations about their shape and the processes that created those shapes. So again, here's a nice example here, kind of a gentle side on the upstream side. So upstream is to the left. There's the river down this way, going to the south, and then a much more abrupt, uh, steeper side over here on the downstream side. I'm gonna to head to this big boulder because it's a nice classic shape or size, I suppose, but you can see a lot of these boulders have very similar orientations. So again, a very gentle side facing upstream, which is to the left here, and then a much more abrupt side here uh, on the downstream side. Let me show you a diagram I put together that will hopefully explain this in a little bit more detail. Get some of the grass out of the way. So if we look at <clears throat> during the flood itself, so this is a cross section showing the river during the Bonneville flood, the water moving from left to right, all the little specks in there are meant to be sand and smaller gravels, anything that the river had the energy to transport. The big boulders were not able to be lifted and transported during the flood but they were able to kind of roll and uh, maybe skip and hop and jump along the bottom we sometimes call that bed load when we talk about streams eventually these boulders came to rest as they came out of that constriction in the channel that narrow section just upstream and entered this wider section of the canyon well once they came to rest the water was still moving at a pretty good clip here and so it was still transporting all the sand the smaller gravel maybe volleyball sized rocks baseball sized rocks that sort of thing and so those rocks hitting the upstream side of the boulders caused them to get chipped little pieces to be broken off over time and so ultimately that bombardment and sandblasting by the sand and gravel eventually after the flood shape them into these these characteristic asymmetric shapes we see here like this boulder in front of us here with the gentle side facing upstream and a much steeper side on the right here or on the downstream side so that's hopefully a helpful diagram that helps explain some of the shapes we see with these boulders let's uh look around a little bit more uh, and then we'll sign off here but what we're looking for here again some of these really polished surfaces on these boulders uh, just really impressive the amount of erosion and sculpting of the not just the landscape but the rocks themselves uh, the Bonneville flood was able to achieve and what I'm sort of looking for here is a boulder that might show us some nice striations you can see a little bit here this isn't bad kind of getting closer you can see there's some lines in this direction here and we would we would assume then that the lines we see as this rock gets sandblasted should be more or less parallel to the direction of water flow if we look over here on this adjacent boulder uh, it shows up pretty nicely as well you can see the lines in the rock more or less moving 
up and down on your screen there showing the direction of movement as the water and its sediment load passed over these rocks. So really just exquisite. Uh, one of the parts of the Bonneville flood story. Another great scenic location here near the Snake River and Interstate 84. Uh, appreciate you spending time with me, learning a little bit of geology. Uh, please like and share and subscribe and spread the good word. Uh, if you feel compelled to donate, there's a donate button on the banner of the YouTube page and there's always a link under the description where you can um, donate if you feel so inclined. But have a great day and enjoy the scenic beauty here of Southern Idaho.